SBI Perspectives. Driven by insights delivered from experience. Welcome to SBI TV. Driven by insights and delivered from experience, SBI helps innovative companies grow their revenue, margin, and enterprise value in ways never before possible. I'm Tony Erickson, your host and managing director at SBI. Today's guest is Sid Nair, board member, growth advisor, and former commercial leader turned CEO. Sid participated in SBI's fall CEO growth advisory board last month, where he engaged with peer CEOs discussing challenges and opportunities on topics relative to high growth. Sid, welcome to the show today. It's a pleasure to have you join us on SBI TV. Thank you, Tony. I always enjoy coming back to the studio. Just walking in here inspires me, so looking forward to a great session. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Our first topic we're going to cover today, Sid, is you spent 20 years working in large publicly traded enterprise companies, executing large-scale transformations. But since then, you've shifted to smaller PE-backed companies with accelerated transformations. I know a lot of our listening audience have an interest in learning from your experience. In many PE-backed companies, you are operating in months, not years, as a CEO, and there are different expectations for growth from the CEO in a variety of firms. So, tell us, <clears throat> how do CEOs grow faster in 2022 with less time being given from their owners? Sure. It's, it's been an been a exciting ride for sure. You know, the first 20 years, you know, working for some of those big, uh, large uh, corporations where you still have to do a lot of transformation. Uh, and then you get into smaller companies, different expectations uh, from the sponsors because they want you to grow every week. It's not in months, it's not in quarters. And uh, <clears throat> the one thing that I've learned is um, the uh, growth mindset is something that has really helped me uh, throughout my journey. Uh, now, a lot of people talk about growth mindset, right? But what does it really mean? Uh, so the growth mindset is not about just, okay, here are revenue targets, here are sales targets, and let's grow. Uh, but what I've seen work really well is uh, figure out a model by which you communicate uh, what that growth mindset means to not just the sales team, which is the easy part. You give them targets and they grow. But how do you tell the recruitment team uh, what does the growth mindset mean? How many people do you need to hire? watch out for you know, attrition, uh, how do you tell the ops team, how do you churn less, right? Because if you churn less, you can grow more. Uh, how do you tell the marketing team that demand generation has to work at a certain pace? So uh, from my perspective, what I've really seen is if you're able to communicate and translate uh, you know, that growth mindset across different parts of the organization, and so everyone's not just thinking about revenue growth and sales growth, but what does it mean to each of those different departments? That's worked well. Now, defining some of these uh, departmental scorecards, I mean, I call them balanced scorecards that you know, we all talk about, but a balanced scorecard at the company level uh, is very different. You talk about revenue, you talk about sales, you can talk about churn, customer sat, NPS, and so on and so forth. But at the department level, if you start defining those scorecards that align to the growth agenda, that's really worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, outside of all this, Tony, you still have stakeholder management. Uh, you know, when you're in a bigger company, hey, it's the CEO, <laughs> right? Uh, but when you're in a smaller company, you're reporting to the board and you're reporting to, uh, you know, you could have one sponsor, multiple sponsors. How do you keep them engaged? How do you uh, define what the growth agenda is? Uh, and set the right expectations. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but it's been fun. Uh, it's, uh, it's definitely been uh, interesting. Yeah, I love your analogy there and, and talking about the growth mindset because that's exactly what it is and everyone needs to understand their part. Yeah. And, and so explain to me a little bit more about the balanced scorecard because, you know, we've, we've all read the, the academic literature around it, the OKR methodology of yes. John Doerr and there's, there's a whole bunch of others. But how do you ensure that the people on the front line, the first line managers, regardless of what department you're in, right. all understand that growth mindset, and how do you create accountability in a cross-functional model? Yes, so one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, at least I've had uh, reasonable success, I would say, is defining the balance scorecard at the company level, that's a little easier to do. Now, with larger companies, that's already defined. Mm -hmm. But when you come in and work with smaller companies, uh, that where a lot of things are broken, uh, typically you got to, uh, it's interesting that you have a transformation agenda and how do you grow and transform the company at the same time? Mm -hmm. So that's 
uh, you know, a double-edged sword because now you have to reset expectations across the, uh, not just with your stakeholders, but also with different people in the company because especially with a smaller company, uh, a lot of people, you know, if you think big companies uh, have silos, smaller companies have even bigger silos. Yeah. Silos are small, but they're bigger. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's a little more complex. So the balance scorecard, uh, you know, uh, starts off with company level metrics, which I just spoke about, revenue, sales, churn, NPS, you know, uh, 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 EPS, you know, you, you can decide what is important. And then you go down to each department. So for example, the ops team, uh, you know, a couple of things that uh, we drive with the operations team is uh, when you onboard a new client, uh, how quickly can you onboard the client? For example, it used to be about 45, 50 days in the past, we brought it down to 20 days. And we called it revenue acceleration, right? Yep. So now you're defining to that ops team why it's important to onboard a client faster. It's actually going back, I mean, the sooner you bring that client on board, the more re the revenue gets generated much faster mm -hmm. and it translates to profit and growth. Now, they don't get that part, but the minute you tell them, hey, you're doing 45 days onboarding, you've got to bring it down to 20 days, mm -hmm. they know how to get that done. Yeah. So that's one example. Now, the other example is just, I spoke about recruitment, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So unless you set the right uh, metrics for the recruitment team in terms of, you know, what are the things that you need to do to go out and get talent, not just identified, but onboarded much faster. Mm -hmm. But it also, uh, we also get the recruitment team to start thinking about attrition and then think about external brand uh, you know focused things like you know glass door and you know things that impact your employee brand uh, both internally and externally how can the recruitment team actually help us all of that yeah. now if you're a growing company if you have growth uh, coming up you have to think about not just open requisitions for today you have to start thinking about open requisitions for the next six months. Mm -hmm. But that again mm -hmm. becomes a growth agenda for the recruitment team. Those are just a few examples of these balanced scorecards that uh, you, know, you can build at a department level. And again, it's not just me sitting and building it out, but we actually bring those department leaders on board and then we try to bring the, get them all engaged and say, this is what you're doing and do you agree with some of these metrics? And if you focus on that, it's gonna help us drive the company uh, forward, so. Yeah. No, I like that. And, and kind of the takeaway for me there is no company is too small to have silos. I think that's, that's the Absolutely. key point there because large or small, they always exist. They so do. That's, a, that's a great point. So moving on, um, from your contributions in multiple growth advisory discussions with SBI and your peers, we have learned that you are committed to building a winning culture and your leadership style appears to resonate with teams. With that in mind, and growing faster in less time in mind, how would you advise other CEOs to align their go-to-market teams to execute effectively going into 22? I, I, great question, Tony. And uh, uh, the go-to-market strategy is sometimes uh, overrated and sometimes underdefined. Uh, so what I have always seen uh, work pretty well is go to markets uh, does not reside just with the sales team, right? So it's an integrated go to market strategy that requires definition and then buy-in from everyone else across the company, right? Whether it's the operations team, whether it's the marketing team, whether it's HR, recruitment, everyone's got to buy into that go to market strategy because if we are signing on new customers faster than ever before, then there's a downstream impact to how quickly can we get those customers uh, you know, up and running, and then how quickly can we you know, onboard new talent to support some of these new customers. So you can have a go-to-market strategy that says sell, 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 but you can't just have them going and selling stuff, which you know, it's gonna take time to implement and, and kind of onboard. So uh, the other thing that uh, has really helped in, in, in my past life is defining uh, very specific action items uh, for say the sales teams. So when you go and onboard a new customer, make sure uh, uh, for new logos and new clients, don't go sell them uh, the coolest thing that you have or you know, in, 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 your, in your back pocket. Sell them something that works because new customers, unlike your existing customers, are not, uh, they have low, very low tolerance level, right, mm -hmm. for errors and mistakes. So sometimes we think about a go-to-market strategy and say, oh, just add as many new logos as you can, but you know what, you can lose them much faster too, yeah. and you can really uh, cause issues with your brand. So new logo expansion, do it with products and services that work well, 
And then don't ever forget your existing customers. Yeah. Uh, so, so important. Your customer engagement, uh, you know, uh, principles and, you know, methodology, uh, uh, we should never, ever forget that because we try to do all of these different things. We look at, you know, transformation programs. We look at enter new markets, new segments. But hey, you've got a bunch of clients mm -hmm. that pay your bills every day. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. You've heard us talk about this at a lot of advisory boards. Yes. And, and the, the, the cliche term is retention is the new growth. Absolutely. And it's been around for a while, but yes. it's, it's so overlooked, yes. especially in today's world of yes. recurring revenue and yes. annuity revenue streams. Yes. Those existing clients are so important, yes. and it's hard to grow if you don't serve what you've already got. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so. no, that's a, that's a great point. So, so last topic I want to cover. You and I have a similar background in that we both came up from the outsourcing environment, technology, applications, and infrastructure. And one of the cliches in that world that we both came from is, well, it's just people process technology. It's simple. Yeah. Well, you know, coming from that school of thought. Now in the chair of the CEO, what is the people, process, and technology sure. to create a commercial engine? It, sure. It's no longer about having an ERP system up and running like our old days. Yeah. When you think about people, process, and technology, how do you apply that to go to market? No, I think uh, you, you're, you're so true, right? I mean, way back, you know, 20, 25 years back, people, process, technology, get it right, everything else works. Nope, that's just the basic foundations. What I have seen work really well, Tony, is a management system uh, that you got to build for each of the businesses, right? I mean, uh, depending on, you know, if you're in the software industry, you, you, could, you, can, you can tweak the management system, but the management system that I'm talking about is a cadence of meetings, cadence of scorecards, uh, a cadence of governance models that you use across a wide spectrum. And the wide spectrum is not too wide, right? The things that you have to do with your customer, very important, whether it's a QBR, whether it's you know your regular sales forecast meetings, your deal governance meetings, uh, whether it's you know customer satisfaction process and you know your NPS process. So we got to have a, a a great methodology by which we track all of that and execute that. All things to do with the customer. Now, if you're a product company or a technology company, uh, what's the product roadmap? What's the technology roadmap? What are the new product uh, introductions that you're doing? What are you doing to you know, uh, update existing products? Are you working on customer feedback? Uh, now, are we introducing, um, say, are we moving to the cloud? So how are those new programs going on the tech side, right? A new product implementation. So, so we've got to spend a lot of time to make sure that the product leaders, the tech leaders also understand that you're part of a management system in a cadence and you've got deliverables that you have to you know, uh, g give back on a regular basis. Then I move to transformation programs, like I said. Uh, growth uh, seems simple, but there's always transformation happening, whether yeah. it's go-to-market transformation, people transformation, you're doing um, you know, market transformation, marketing transformation. So the question now becomes, uh, how do you have the right transformation programs in place like for example, cost transformation, we don't talk about it too much uh, because then people in the company get freaked out about, oh, they're doing cost cutting. No, we're not doing cost cutting. Yeah. We're throwing cost management to make sure we can get some savings so we can invest in new products and new markets or, or hiring more people. Uh, so I, I look at other things like uh, you know stakeholder management, especially if you're working with uh, uh, in, in the PE space. You know you've got to, your primary sponsor. You've got to make sure you've got a cadence of meetings and reviews that you can deal with them. Uh, then you've got lenders. You also have other sponsors, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the different board members as well, right? How do you uh, actually make sure that they understand uh, uh, you know what you're trying to uh, drive and grow uh, and uh, set the right expectations? And then outside of this, you have. All all your financial and operating metrics, right? Which is what a lot of people initially focus on. But even on that, if you if you can drive the right cadence uh, of this entire you know spectrum, if you will, right from the customers to product to technology, employee yeah. focus. I just that's the other part. You sometimes you forget about our employees. So so the one piece we didn't touch on, which I would really appreciate some final thoughts, because when you talk about people, process, and technology, from an organic perspective, that's kind of quote easy, right? I mean, but now, as you've done, when you start being acquisitive and rolling companies together, yes. now you've got to kind of pick the best of breed yes. and pick the go forward path and make sure that everyone's on board. Yes. So as you think about people, process, and technology combining multiple corporations, yes. how do you resolve that? So I, it's one of the things that has worked well is 
uh, define a mission and vision statement for the company. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, like for example, I've been in places where we've acquired seven companies and we had to come together as one, and none of the seven companies had a mission and vision statement. So, but you can actually bring people together from these different, uh, now they're departments, they're no longer companies, right? These seven companies are different departments. Mm -hmm. uh, spend some time and say, hey, let's build a common mission and vision statement. Uh, again, the mission statement is, is, is slightly, you know, uh, right here and then. The vision statement is where you want to go. Yep. And then a value statement, very important, because the value statements resonate with your people. Uh, this is what we stand for. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is what we believe in. That brings people together. I've seen that as well, right? So those three things have really helped quite a bit, especially when you do acquisitions and you bring, you know, different people from different companies together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw it back at, uh, when I was at HPE Enterprise Services, we were 75,000 people. Yeah. We merged with CSC to form DXC. Yeah. We've now 150,000 people. <laughs> so even though it's two companies, these are two big companies. Yeah. <laughs> so, so having having spent some time there as well um, in one of the prior iterations of it, I think the best quote about that company was, you know, it's not like turning a tanker. That's the classic analogy. It's like turning 150,000 kayaks and I trying to get them to go in the same direction. Absolutely. And that's that's the challenge with a services yes. industry. When you're reliant on people, motivating people to go in the same yes. direction is a CEO's biggest challenge. But yes. you get that right, and you get your company right. I fully agree. And I think the key is also don't just say, you know, just because you're sitting up there uh, at, at the top of the food chain, right? You can't just go and say, this is the mission statement, this is the vision statement, this is the value mm -hmm. statement bring teams together, let the people define it, right? Yeah. Of course, you're gonna bless it for sure, but now when it becomes, hey, this is your mission statement that you all agreed to, they you know, stand behind it yep. and it works well. That's excellent. Sid, as always, thank you for being a friend of the firm, participating in advisory boards, joining us again on SBI TV. It's always a pleasure and we are thrilled to have you on the show as always and uh, we look forward to working with you again in the future. Thank you, Tony. I love being associated with SBI and obviously coming back to the studio. And I always learn a lot from all your customer advisory board sessions as well. So uh, happy to be associated and looking forward to staying in touch. Awesome. All thank right. you. Thank you. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in to SBI TV, the growth advisory. To learn more, visit sbigrowth.com.